Good afternoon, and thank you for coming out to our first Lunch and Learn program. Um, if you're looking for ways to avoid scams and protect your identity, you are in the right location. Um, thank you for those of, um, joining, joining us online. Um, we will be recording this presentation. Um, so for sound quality and just for the flow of the presentation, um, we'll hold questions until the end. And then either myself or Russell will ask that question. Or maybe if you guys want, you can come up here and ask the question. Um, let me introduce you to Kate Kramer up there in the small little window. Um, she is joining us from um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And she's joining us all the way from Washington, DC. Um, so thank you, Kate. I hear it's really cold over there. <laughs> uh, we just had a big blast of cold air and I think you guys are getting it. <laughs> Um, so thank you for taking the time to join uh, join us um, and um, share your expertise with our our patrons. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I think you all are a little more used to the the chill in the snow than we are in DC. When it comes here, people do not know what to do. <laughs> um, so, anyways, thanks so much for having me. Let me share my screen. Uh, anyhow, I'm Kate Kramer. I'm a policy analyst with the Office for Older Americans at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And I work on projects related to age-friendly banking, fraud and scams, and financial technology. So I'm very happy to be here with you today. And I just wanted to say thanks to everyone who is joining, whether it be in person or virtually, as well as those who might be watching the recording afterwards. To kick things off, um, I have a really quick disclaimer. Basically, this presentation is being made by a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau representative on behalf of the Bureau, and any opinions or views that I state today are my own. Now that we have that out of the way, let me share a little about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, as well as our Office for Older Americans. So we're a federal agency, and our mission is to help consumer finance markets work by making rules, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering people to take more control over their economic lives. And addressing fraud and scams is one of our goals at the CFPB. And our Office for Older Americans work focuses on developing policies and producing consumer education materials that help people to make good financial decisions for themselves as they age. And we have a ton of free educational resources that are targeted towards folks age 62 and older, as well as professionals who might interact with older adults, financial caregivers, and all kinds of different people. And really, a lot of our materials are for people of all ages. They can be very helpful for anyone. So uh, as we dig into talking about the problem of scams, I'm going to share some statistics about how scams are affecting our country and all of us. And I just wanted to ask you, feel free to raise your hands if you're in person, or you can comment in the chat box or use the virtual hand raise feature in Zoom if you're joining online. But I wanted to ask how many of you all have ever gotten a scam call, a scam text, or a scam email? Me, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> sounds about right. And how about in the last month? I have. Last <laughs> in month. the last week? Yeah, I just got about 10 of them today. <laughs> so I, I can tell that um, most of us have had that experience. So for the next 45 minutes or so, we'll take a closer look at the problem of scams. So this slide and the others that will follow contain data from the Federal Trade Commission's database, and it includes new data that was just released in October. So the FTC got 5.2 million reports about fraud in 2022. And the top three types of reports that they received were identity theft, imposter scams, and credit bureau or credit reporting issues. And at the bottom of this slide, you can see information about financial loss due to scams. So of all the people who reported that they experienced fraud or scams, about 26% reported losing money to the fraud. And we know from research that if you can recognize scams, you're less likely to lose money to them, which is why it's really important for all of us to share knowledge about this topic with our friends, family, and community members. Oftentimes the people like yourselves who come to these presentations may already have an interest or have some knowledge in the topic. And it's really great if you can share this with the folks who 
may not be in the room or may not um, go proactively to find the information for themselves. So I encourage you to do that. So let's look at some trends related to age. Contrary to what a lot of people believe, younger adults are more likely to report losing money to scams than older adults. However, when older adults do lose money, they tend to report higher dollar losses than younger people, uh, maybe because they have more life savings or um, there could be a variety of reasons. But on the right, you'll see the dollar losses for different age groups. And you can see there's a median loss of about $1,600 for people over age 80 compared to about $500 for people in their 20s. So you can see from the data, it's really important to focus on the issue of scams uh, for people of all ages, but there may be certain different impacts on different age groups. The top category of fraud reports that the FTC received in 2022 was imposter scams. So that had by far the largest number of reports, over 700,000. But with imposter scams, there was a lower percentage of people who experienced financial losses. And there's also a smaller median um, dollar loss than some other categories. And we'll talk more today about the different varieties of imposter scams, things like online dating scams and tech support scams. And we'll go through what you might need to watch for and ways you can prevent them. But imposter scams and all of these different variations continue to be a huge problem every year. 22% of people lose money when they're targeted with these types of scams, and over $2.6 million was stolen in total from American consumers. Next on the top 10 list, you'll see online shopping scams, lottery scams, and investment scams, which we'll also talk about later today. And those investment scams also include a new twist in recent years, which is the cryptocurrency investment scam, which we'll touch on also. And below that are business and job opportunity scams and several other scam types. With the investment scams, you can see that very high percentages of people who are targeted with these did report losing money. And they also had the largest median losses of all of the categories. So investment scams are a big problem for American consumers. It's also really important to look at how people pay scammers. The reason for that is that we know if you pay a scammer by certain methods, like a gift card or a wire transfer or a prepaid card, you're much less likely to get back any of the money that's stolen from you. And this chart takes a closer look at that. On the left with the darker rows, you can see which payment method people used when they lost money to scams. So you see credit cards up there at the top and then debit cards. On the right in the lighter green color, you can see how much money they lost. So you can see that even though credit cards are the most popular form of payment, they actually result in smaller dollar losses, often because those losses might be reimbursed by the credit card company or for other reasons. But by contrast, cryptocurrency and bank transfers result in really high dollar losses. Those are those two bars on the right that you can see sticking way out beyond the others. And this slide shows the different types of ways that scammers contacted their targets, along with the percentage of people who reported losing money. So the contact method is the dark green bar, and the percentage of people who reported losing money are the light green bars. So higher percentages of people who got contacted by a criminal through a website, an app, social media, or online ads or pop-ups, all of these different online methods, reported losing money to the fraud. So those were higher percentages of lost money. Although those contact methods were less commonly reported than other methods like the phone calls and texts that, like me, you probably get every day, <laughs> people were a lot like and more likely to lose money if they did get contacted online. And among those online contact methods, social media is continuing to stand out. The total reported losses increased from $163 million in 2021 to $277 million in 2022. Text message scams came in second to phone calls in terms of the total number of contacts. But the loss there on tech scams also more than doubled from 41 million in 2021 to 90 million in 2022. 
So like a lot of people, I, I mentioned that I've gotten a lot of tech scams and phone call scams over the years. And it seems like the number of tech scams that I've been receiving has grown recently. And the scammers are just really good at what they do. Sometimes I'm shocked by how convincing what I get is. They're so good at convincing us to respond or to click. And we'll talk in a bit about how to recognize and avoid some of those common scams. So this slide highlights, again, some of the total dollars that older adults reported as stolen from them, organized by fraud type. And it looks at, in particular, you can see at the top, investment scams, business imposters, romance scams, government imposters. A lot of these different types of imposter scams feature on the list. And the reported losses are just continuing to soar every year. So let's go through some examples of scams. I'm going to talk about uh, just four in particular, but I want to quickly give an overview of some different examples that we see in our work at CFPB. So some of these might include the theft of cash or the theft of valuables. It could be an unauthorized bank account withdrawal or unauthorized use of a credit card. It could be the improper use of a power of attorney or guardianship to take advantage of someone. It could also be things like a lottery scam. Maybe you get a call saying you won the lottery. In order to collect, you just have to pay a whole bunch of fees and taxes. Um, a lot of these scams are designed to either get people into a state of excitement. like Yes, I won something. I can't wait. I'm so excited to, to use the money. And um, people may not think as clearly as they normally would when they're in that excited state, or they put them into a state of fear. So they're afraid. For example, some of the imposter scams like the IRS scam will call and be very threatening. The scammers are very good. They actually work with human psychologists and employ them on staff. Typically it's organized criminals who have a lot of people in a call center sending out the same message to hundreds or hundreds of thousands of people and they really know how to tailor whatever they're telling you to do their best to get you to respond. Um, a couple other examples are here. Um, reverse mortgage fraud often is an attempt to steal equity out of your property. There's also uh, another type of fraud related to housing, which is contractor fraud. Often you'll see a lot of those after a natural disaster. Maybe there's a hurricane or a fire or a tornado and then these contractor um, criminals come out of the woodwork. <coughs> Excuse me. Fake charity scammers often will use the name of a legitimate charity. They may pretend to be affiliated with that organization. They're sometimes passed around on social media and sometimes scammers will target a respected community member first. They try to create a false sense of legitimacy and then draw other people into the scheme. And as you probably know, since you said you're also receiving these calls, new scams seem to pop up every day. So these are four um, that we talked about that were in some of the highest categories for frequency or for dollar losses. So we're gonna focus on these four since there are too many different scams to cover in one presentation. And then we'll also talk a bit about identity theft. So let's start with online dating scams. These might also be called romance scams or sweetheart scams, but these often happen when somebody meets another person online. Maybe they signed up for a dating app, maybe they meet them through a regular social media platform like Facebook, but they often start online. The criminal will start what seems to be a relationship. They will start showering the person with affection and attention it may happen for days, weeks, or even months before they eventually start asking for money. Often they will say that they need money for a fake emergency situation. Maybe they say that they had an accident or they need a medical procedure. Sometimes they'll ask for money for travel to visit you, but typically they want you to wire that money or send it via cryptocurrency or a prepaid card, or sometimes they'll even ask for access to your bank account. And if you know someone who has been involved in a romance scam, you'll know that these scams pull on people's heartstrings. It can be really difficult for people to recognize that their new romance is in fact a scam. And it's really heartbreaking. So some ways that you can help to recognize these types of scams 
Again, the big tip off is that a love interest is asking for money, maybe for an emergency or travel. But it's also important to think about how they're asking you to pay. If they're asking for a wire transfer, prepaid cards, gift cards, those are all red flags. And to protect against these, on the right side of the slide, you can see some tips that you can share with friends and family. So limiting the personal financial information that you share with uh, anyone, really, <laughs> but a new person. And as well as the personal information, even not financial, just the personal information generally that you share online. Because often what scammers do is they look at your online presence, maybe your Facebook profile, or if you have a personal website or some other presence online, and they'll use that to create a fake profile that has several of your interests in common. Maybe they'll pretend to love dogs just like you or have the same favorite sports team or create other similarities with you. So general practices like limiting what personal information you have available online can also help to keep you safe from these types of scams. And to give you an idea of how these romance criminals operate, these are some of the most common lines that they use. Like I said, they often fake an emergency. Lately, over the past few years, they've begun to pretend to very generously <laughs> teach you how to invest in cryptocurrency. They may say, I want to share my, my own experience building my wealth. It's so exciting, it's so easy. And then they may um, do their best to convince you to invest in cryptocurrency and then make off with the money themselves. It's also pretty common for people to say that they're in the military or they're on an oil rig or a ship to explain why they're not more accessible or able to visit you. Or they may come up with some other type of career that keeps them in a foreign country. And as you can see on this slide, romance scammers are increasingly asking people to pay by cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. And this also includes an increase in person-to-person -person payment apps like Zelle or Venmo or Cash App. A lot of these newer payment methods are getting used more frequently. So for those of you who do want to spread the word about these romance scams, our agency has a ton of free handouts that you can order for free in bulk or just a few copies. You can also download them for free, um, but you could order them to hand out in your community at events like this, or you could even just download them and share it in an email to your friends and family whatever works best for you. But we have a ton of these different handouts and we also have bookmarks, activity sheets, and you can get them in English and Spanish. And they're a really great way to help give some of the nuts and bolts of how to avoid these types of scams. So the second fraud type I want to talk about is the tech support scam. Here's how you might experience this. They often start through either an unsolicited phone call from someone saying that they're tech support and they need to remote into your computer to either make an update or remove an urgent virus. It could also be a pop-up on your computer that appears and tells you to call tech support or to click on a link. Or it could be an email that gives you a link to click on and says something similar. You have a virus, act quickly or all of your files will be deleted. Um, a lot of false urgency is involved in these types of scams. So again, on the right side, you'll see the, the tips to prevent against these scams. One is don't give control of your computer to anyone who calls you out of the blue or contacts you out of the blue. Number two is don't click on links in any pop-ups or emails or other unsolicited um, communications that you get because if you click on a link, it could take you to a website that automatically downloads malicious software that can then um, take information from your computer or log whatever keys you're pressing to capture your passwords and uh, can cause a whole lot of trouble. It's also really important, and I have been guilty of this in the past, um, to keep your antivirus software up to date in order to help guard against these scams. Sometimes I'll let an update linger or um, not do what I'm supposed to do, but it's really important to think about setting your antivirus to auto update and make sure that you have a current version installed. Again, we also have um, placemats on online safety tips. So it goes over some of the tips we're talking about today, things like using strong passwords, um, limiting the personal information you share online, 
talks about the red flags of scams. So if you're interested in handing these out or sharing them with others, please feel free to either order or download them. In investment scams, which as we talked about earlier, are some of the scams with the highest dollar amount loss and the highest frequency of loss, scammers often try to take advantage of people's trust or inexperience, but they can also target and be successful with savvy investors. They're very creative. Typically, these scams work by asking you to put your money into something that they say is a no-risk investment, or they may just say, I'm very experienced, I know what I'm doing, I've made a ton of money, trust me, I'll take care of it. Scammers also sometimes make fake training courses on how to do things like invest in cryptocurrency, or they may just say they'll teach you how to invest in cryptocurrency like Bitcoin to make a bunch of money. They might then lead you through setting up an account on a cryptocurrency exchange. Often they'll start by telling you to make a few small investments. Maybe you see some payoff from them and feel more comfortable. And then they'll try to convince you to invest more and ultimately steal it all from you. Sometimes these are people you know, people you know from your neighborhood or your faith group or your community. So they'll take advantage of that trust. Other times it's someone maybe you learn about through uh, an online ad, or maybe they contact you directly via social media or another method. They can come from a variety of sources. But the biggest red flags of investment scams are they're saying act now, act before it's too late. They're trying to put the pressure on or they're promising something like a guaranteed high interest rate or no risk. And unfortunately, it'd be great if this wasn't the case, but it's not possible to guarantee a certain interest rate and investments always carry some high, some level of risk. It's also a red flag if the person you're talking to, maybe an investment broker, advisor, or someone that you're speaking with online, maybe tells you you should put all of your money in one place or won't tell you how they get paid from helping you. So in terms of protecting yourself and tips you can share with friends and family. Number one is take your time, do your research. Don't be pressured into any deals that say act now. If you're talking to a broker or an investment advisor, you can check their background and see if they have any disciplinary actions or if they're registered at all um, on FINRA's website, the Financial Institutions Regulatory Authority. You should also make sure before you hire anyone to interview them, you can ask them questions about how they get paid and also ask how you can file a complaint if you're not happy with their services. AARP actually has a really good tool on their website about how to interview your investment advisor. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. So I wanna move on to our fourth type of scam for today, which is imposter scams. And as we mentioned, these include all kinds of different variations. <laughs> and scammers are always coming up with a new twist. But one example of a common imposter scam is the family emergency scam, which also sometimes gets called the grandparent scam if it's targeting someone who is a grandparent. In this scenario, the imposter or criminal will call you, they'll pretend to be a family member, maybe a child or a grandchild, niece or nephew, somebody who's in trouble. They may know that person's name. Often they can find it very easily on social media. People have everything online these days. But the scammer is usually crying or they say that they've had their nose broken. They do something to explain the difference in voice so that you don't question why they don't sound exactly like your family member. Typically they'll say, please send money right away. You need to wire it. You need to buy gift cards. You need to send money in some fashion, but don't tell any other family members. I don't want them to worry or I'm scared they'll be angry with me. And a lot of people being kind souls and caring about our family members will immediately jump to the assistance of that person. Maybe we won't ask questions until later. Scammers also know that maybe you can attribute any odd statements or confusion to the stress of the situation. And I did want to note also that there's new technology um, that has been created over the past several years that allows criminals to take um, a short video that someone has maybe posted on social media 
or um, any kind of example of their voice. And they can take that and replicate someone's voice and make them say anything they want. This is called voice cloning. So given that criminals can even fake a voice nowadays, it's really important if you get a call about someone in an emergency to stop and call that person back at a number you know for them. If you don't get them, which sometimes happens, maybe they're at work or doing something else, it's good to check in with other family members who might be able to verify their whereabouts or even call their office to see if they're there. Another common imposter scam that you might have received, I know I have, is the IRS scam. So criminals typically pretend to be calling from the IRS. Maybe they threaten to arrest you or say you owe a bunch of money. But typically they'll say, you, you owe taxes, you have to pay them back immediately. Sometimes they'll target specific groups like immigrants and say, if you don't follow these instructions, we'll deport you. Or they could threaten that they will shut off your utilities or revoke your driver's license. They may say almost anything to try to threaten you and get you to send them the money. Usually they're very hostile to try to scare you. Sometimes in another twist on this, they may tell you you're entitled to a big refund <laughs> to try to get you excited, sort of like the lottery scam rather than scare you. But if they're unsuccessful, they might even call back and try different strategies, pretend to be a different person from the IRS office. Another way and similar to the voice cloning where they can copy your voice is that criminals can spoof or copy the IRS toll-free number so that the number that you see coming up on your caller ID is the real IRS number and make it seem like it's really the IRS calling you. There's software that um, can be easily downloaded online to fake caller ID, so that's really common. It's also common that they would use a real IRS staff person's name that they find online or use a fake IRS badge number to try to seem like they're a real person from the IRS. So if you get contacted by someone who says they're the IRS, hang up and take some time to think. If you think there is a chance that you might actually owe back taxes, call the IRS's real number directly to verify. Otherwise, it's likely a scam. All right, so we've covered our four scam types, and I want to touch now on identity theft before we dive into some of the other free resources that we have available. So identity theft happens when criminals steal your personal information, maybe your social security number, your birth date, your credit card or debit card numbers, or your bank account number. It could be your personal identification number, your PIN, or your password. But with enough information, another person can use your identity to open financial accounts in your name or to commit fraud or other crimes. So let's talk about some tips for preventing and recognizing identity theft. First is protect your personal information. Don't provide your social security number or your bank account information in response to a, an unwanted phone call or an email or a text message, even if the circumstances appear to be very friendly or very official. It's also good, um, as many of us have heard before, to watch out for folks who might be trying to look over your shoulder if you use the ATM, trying to get your PIN. And just in case your wallet gets lost or stolen, it's good to carry only the identification you really need, like carry maybe one credit card or one debit card. Keep the rest, including your social security card, in a safe place, maybe somewhere in your home or in a safe deposit box, somewhere that you feel comfortable keeping it. You don't have to give people your social security number either. I know sometimes I get asked by a merchant for it or someone that doesn't seem like they really have a need to know. And if they request it, you can ask them to use another form of identification like a driver's license or a passport or something else. And often they don't actually need your social security number at all. If you have a mailbox, it's really good to try to use a, a locked mailbox or another secure location so that people can't just reach in and take out your mail. If your mailbox isn't locked, it's good to try to get your mail out of the mailbox right away after it's been delivered or maybe move it to a safer location if you can. When you're doing things like ordering new checks or you know you're going to be receiving some kind of financial information, 
Sometimes you can ask to have your checks delivered to the bank branch and pick them up instead of having them mailed to your home where someone can grab them. But I know it can be tough to balance safety versus convenience, but um, these are tips that you can consider. And if you're going to be sending mail that has like a check you're sending or other personal information that you're putting into the mail, ideally you could deposit it into one of the, you, the postal service blue boxes, the big mail boxes, or take it to the post office or hand it to your mail carrier instead of just leaving it, you know, sitting on top of your mailbox or in your mailbox for someone to take. Because there are thieves who they just cruise neighborhoods. They look for account information. So it's good to be as protective as you can when you're receiving or sending mail. Also, um, there are people who do what they call dumpster diving, which is basically searching through your trash, looking for paper that has things like your bank account information or other information they can use to commit fraud. So your best protection there is rip up the paper. Ideally, use a shutter. But if not, rip them up, cut it up with some scissors, try to keep that financial trash as clean as you can. It's really important as well to monitor your bank account statements and credit card bills every month. And if you see something suspicious, maybe there is an unauthorized withdrawal or a charge that you don't understand, let your financial institution know as soon as possible. Also, if you're not getting your bank statements or credit card bills all of a sudden, like they seem to not be arriving, that could be a sign that someone has stolen your account information. Maybe they changed your mailing address to send um, them to their own location. So it's really important if you notice that you're not getting statements you normally get in the mail to follow up with your financial institution as well. A uh, final tip is take a look at your credit report every year. You can look for warning signs of identity theft, for example, a credit card or a loan or a lease that you never signed up for. Um, it's really good to keep an eye on that and make sure there aren't accounts or charges that you don't recognize. And you can get free copies of your credit report from each of the three main credit reporting agencies at annualcreditreport.com. If you do experience fraud or identity theft, you can report it to the Federal Trade Commission. They actually have a special website for identity theft, identitytheft.gov, where they can create a personalized recovery plan based on what happened to you that has steps that you can take after experiencing identity theft. And that way, you can just make sure you're doing what you need to do to protect your identity going forward. So I said, we have a lot of free resources. I'm just going to touch on a few today, but these again are ways that you can use to educate yourself as well as your friends and family about some of these topics. The first, um, for those who might be go-getters, is Money Smart for Older Adults. It's a free program we've designed to help people identify scams and fraud. And I'm guessing uh, some of you in the audience may already have life experience with teaching or presenting or sharing information in other ways. But even if you don't have that experience, we make it really easy for you to teach this information about scams because we provide a full script and a PowerPoint presentation that you can choose to use, or you can just take the script and talk about some of these issues with other people. Um, but you can do a presentation for people in the community like what I'm doing today or you can order copies of our resource guide or our instructor guide just to read for yourself. Again, everything is available for free order or download as well. For those of you who might be helping someone else manage their money, I wanna mention our guides that help financial caregivers. So we have four guides, one for agents under a power of attorney, one for guardians, one for trustees, <coughs> excuse me, and one for Social Security or Department of Veterans Affairs representatives. These are really great guides with kind of plain language information about all of these different financial caregiving roles. So they're great to read if you're serving in one of these roles for someone else, or if you're considering picking someone to serve as your power of attorney or in one of these other roles. So again, you can download these or order them for free um, or ask the library to order them <laughs> after the presentation, and you can get them in English or Spanish. 
We also have a resource if you're earlier in the caregiving process. Maybe you're just starting to notice that a loved one might eventually need some help with managing their finances, or you could just be planning ahead for your own financial future. But knowing your options really helps you choose what works best for your unique situation. This is just a short resource that covers various different types of caregiving options, things um, as simple as a conversation partner who you're able to share a little bit about your finances with, all the way through to more formal caregiving options like power of attorney or government um, fiduciaries. And it also helps you to consider who is the right person to choose for all of these different roles, whatever you might be looking at, who is a good fit for the role. So if you're in that early stage, I encourage you to take a look at this one. Another sort of similar guide has to do with helping people prepare for their financial future. And I like to think of it as imagine a future version of yourself and do what you can to protect yourself now. It's a really great way to plan ahead so that you can stay in control of your finances and plan ahead for the future. We also have tons of resources on all the topics you see here and more. We've got a whole set of guides on reverse mortgages for people who might be considering one, as well as for people who already have one and need some help understanding what their rights and responsibilities are. We've got resources on dealing with different types of debt, like medical debt, resources on whether it makes sense to take a pension advance, given your situation, and lots of others. So if you're looking for financial advice uh, or resources, we've got an Ask CFPB page that has answers to a ton of financial questions in addition to the handouts I just showed. So if you've got questions about any kind of financial product or service, you might be able to find an answer here. And there's lots in there that can help you make more informed financial decisions, better manage your money, understand what all of the terms are that you're hearing um, from a particular financial provider, and more. Finally, if you don't already know, our agency helps people to connect with financial companies. So we help people to fix errors, get direct responses from the company about a problem and understand the issues. So if you've got a problem with a financial product or service like your checking account or your credit card, and you've already reached out to the company and maybe they haven't uh, responded at all or they haven't given you a satisfactory response, you can submit a complaint to our agency and tell us about your issue. And then we'll forward your complaint to the company and we'll work to get your response. Typically you'll get something within 15 days. And you can submit a complaint about loans, including mortgages, student loans, payday loans, auto loans or leases, as well as different types of financial products and services, checking or savings accounts, credit cards, prepaid cards, credit reporting, debt collection, money transfers, check cashing, all of the services you see listed here. And our agency tracks trends in the complaints that we receive, and then we use that data to prioritize where to focus our different work, our policy work, our supervision work when we supervise financial institutions, and our enforcement work where we enforce different laws. And we'll also use specific complaints from consumers to help us identify actions to pursue. So it's really helpful for us to know the types of problems that you might be experiencing so that we can follow up on them. I invite you all to visit our website, um, consumerfinance.gov slash older Americans is our Office for Older Americans homepage. And you can also reach out to us anytime. We have an email address that goes to our team, olderamericans at cfpb.gov. Um, and check out our website. We've got a lot on there. So I just wanna thank you all for your time and attention today. I have lots of time to answer any questions. So if you're joining virtually, you can type them into the chat box or come off mute. And if you're joining in person, I think the staff has a, a mic there that can help you ask your questions so that I can hear it. And I'd also like to hear if you have stories, things you've seen, your own pro tips for avoiding scams. It's a really good opportunity for everyone to learn from each other. And maybe there are local scams that you've experienced that others could benefit from hearing about. So please feel free to speak up with questions or comments. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, that was a lot of information and I learned a lot. So I'm sure a lot of people did here too. So thank you very much. Does anyone have, I don't see any chat coming through on the web. 
Um, but does anyone in person have any questions or stories? Uh, yeah, hi. I just was wondering more about these people that are doing scams. What kind of categories they go in? Is it individuals? Is it syndicates? Is there they considered companies? And how are we catching them? That's a great question. There are a lot of organized crime groups, so you could call it a gang or a syndicate, but essentially there in some areas are warehouses full of people who are trained to scam other people and are calling using scripts and who have managers and supervisors. It, it's almost like a normal office building. So there are very organized and very sophisticated criminal groups doing work as well as individual scammers, there might be someone in your community who wants to take advantage of others or who is um, trying to perpetrate some of these different crimes. So there's a huge variety. And then in terms of what we're doing, a lot of different local and state and federal law enforcement agencies work together on these crimes. I know some of the overseas crimes where there is an overseas criminal group perpetrating crimes against American citizens are a little bit more challenging to prosecute because we may need to coordinate with other governments in other countries. Um, so they can take a longer time to, to catch the person or to find them. But there's a lot of coordination that happens among all different groups of law enforcement, like the FBI may work with the local police on a crime that's affecting a lot of folks in a given area. Um, adult Protective Services and law enforcement may work together to try to help someone. There are a lot of different ways, I think, that come at this problem, but it can be very difficult. I think what we've heard from local law enforcement as well as state and federal law enforcement is that some of these crimes take a lot of resources to prosecute because it's hard to get at somebody who's in a different country. And so they can, they can take time and effort. Hi. Um, when you mention annually check your credit report, I think there's three, I don't know, Transamerica, Experian, maybe another one. And it seems whenever I try to do that, I get flooded with emails looking to, you know, do a car loan or a house loan or a mortgage. Um, where's the best place to check your credit report safely? So annualcreditreport.com dot com is the website that goes to the three main credit bureaus, which are TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. And you can choose to get just one of those or all three of them. I recommend for people to do them once every four months so that you're kind of spreading them out throughout the year and keeping a good eye on it. But if that's too much for you, you want to do it once a year and check all three, you can do that as well. Anything is good. It's good to keep as much on top of it as you can, but annualcreditreport.com is the website. And you annual can also do it by credit. phone. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, annualcreditreport.com. And then they keep it in house and they don't farm it out to all these different lenders. Yeah, that's right, or they're supposed to. If they are doing that, please let us know. <laughs> okay, thank you. After an identity theft, is there a statute of limitations in terms of when you have to file it within one year or two years? Um, I think it would really depend on the, the situation. I'm guessing you're, you're thinking about if someone has stolen money from you, whether there's a statute of limitations to try to get well, that money back. A little slower? Sure, sorry. I'm guessing you're thinking that if someone had stolen money from you due to identity theft, that you would be wondering if there was a statute of limitations to get that money back. Is that right? Yes, to file the report. Mm -hmm. So from my understanding, that would vary because state laws and criminal laws vary and the type of theft or crime that applies might have a different statute of limitations for reporting and recovery. But generally, I think reporting as soon as possible is always ideal. 
And even if it's been a while, it's still worth reporting it because you may be able to help someone else avoid that same problem, even if you're not able to recover all of your money or help yourself at that point, if it's been a few years or something like that. And also, is there a separate site for online fraud as versus other types of fraud? The FBI has the Internet Crimes Complaint Center, or IC3.gov. Uh, it's the three C's are Crimes Complaint Center. Um, so I can put that in the chat. I don't know if the folks in person can see it, but IC3.gov is one other place in addition to the Federal Trade Commission that you can report internet-based crimes of all kinds. And the FBI takes those complaints and they'll also work with local or state law enforcement to investigate them as appropriate. Thank you. Thanks. I had a woman tell me a story about a year ago that somehow a fraudster got into her computer and totally shut it down, contacted her and wanted to ransom her computer back to her, meaning she had to pay a ransom to get any of the information she had on the computer. How does that work? You didn't mention anything about that. And they also told her if she contacted any authority or anybody, she would never see any piece of information that was ever on her computer again. Yeah, those types of scams are really scary. The, they're called often ransomware because what happens is the scammer may send you a, an email or maybe a pop-up on a website that has a link or an attachment that you could download or click. And once you've clicked that link or downloaded that attachment, it can download software onto your website or onto your computer that allows them to control your computer or to steal your information. And often what, what happens with those, like you said, is they'll say, uh, pay a ransom or else you're not getting back access to your computer. Um, so those those are very scary. And that's actually even happened to big companies that have experienced these kinds of ransomware scams where their whole systems have gotten locked down and they've had to pay a ransom to get their systems back up. But to answer your question, a lot of times it comes through a scam email or a website that has a link or attachment that can um, give the scammer access to your computer. Other than reporting it to your organization, can you help that person get their information back without paying the ransom? Yeah, I think it really depends on the situation, but it's good, in my opinion, to report to several places. So you can file a complaint with CFPB, but we're not going to be able to respond as quickly as a local law enforcement um, or the Federal Trade Commission may have good information on that as well. But if, if you're experiencing that type of a scam where it's computer-based, you can report to the Federal Trade Commission, you can call the local police or sheriff to let them know, and they may or may not be able to help depending on the situation. You can file uh, with the IC3, the Internet Crimes Complaint Center run by the FBI. But I would recommend kind of... <laughs> reporting as many places as you can to get as much help as you can. But in those situations, sometimes people don't get their computer back and maybe the criminals can wipe the computer. Um, it's very difficult because paying the ransom also doesn't guarantee that the person gets their data back. The ransom, or sorry, the criminal may just say, thanks for the money and still delete everything in your computer. So it's very risky. And that's why sometimes the best is to try to prevent anything like that from happening by never clicking on links or attachments that you get sent that you, you didn't ask for. Mm. Uh, and then one more question that's along a different line. Of the statistics you reported of the money lost from theft and fraud, 
does that include the amount of money that credit card companies or vendors absorb themselves that you report within a timely time period to your bank or credit card that, hey, I didn't make this charge, uh, kindly remove it, and they do. Is that part of the statistics? So the losses from the Federal Trade Commission data are what people reported that they lost. So it could include money that they ultimately do get reimbursed for or ultimately are able to recover some of at least. That's my understanding. Okay. But in, in most cases, and particularly as I mentioned earlier with certain payment methods like a wire transfer or gift cards, people often aren't getting any of their money back. Do you know if they've had problems with PayPal? Uh, there are lots of reports of scams involving all kinds of different payment methods like PayPal or other um, payment companies. So that um, absolutely there are scams perpetrated through that method. And if you're really interested, you can actually go onto our website and you can look at the consumer complaints um, that CFPB has received. Not all of our complaints get published publicly because the person who files the complaint has to say it's okay with them to have it published. And even then when we publish them, we redact personal information. Uh, but you can actually take a look at the complaints that we have received that are public and get a sense of what's out there, what um, types of scams people are experiencing. What do you think about online banking? I, um, I have several accounts and I know uh, like when I sold my house and I put the money in my account temporarily, I did um, have them discontinue the, uh, the password for that one account um, and, but even though they said they re restarted it, I still can never, I always have to go to the bank and um, uh, to get money out of that account, I always have to go to the bank and, and write a check. But um, anyway, what do you think about online banking? I think online banking can be a great option for people to access their money if it works for them. There are definitely a lot of things you can do to protect yourself when you are online banking, things like having a strong password. Um, a lot of us tend to use things like our child's name or our pet's name or something that is of personal meaning to us. But um, when they've done studies on strong passwords, the strongest are those that are just kind of a combination of a bunch of random numbers and letters and symbols. Um, although those can be harder to remember because they don't come naturally to us, those tend to be stronger passwords, as well as using what they call multi-factor authentication, which uh, is basically when you may type in your password and then they'll also send you a text message to your phone with a specific code, or they'll send you an email with a specific code, or they'll use some other method in addition to your password to confirm that you are who you say you are. So there are different ways like that that you can use to protect yourself and make sure that your online banking account is harder to access for someone who's maybe trying to get in there. Um, also, somebody told me that regularly you should change your passwords. Is that true? I've heard that as well. I think even more important than that is to not have the same password for everything, which I have been guilty of. And I'm sure other people may have the same problem. But it's really good to have a different password for everything so that if, um, to be frank, there are a lot of data breaches these days. It seems like every month or two you hear about another big company that has had a data breach. And if you're using the same password for everything, that means your password is uh, on the internet being sold by criminals to other criminals to try to hack into all of your different accounts. So it's best to use different passwords for each, each um, login, each company. And I think that is maybe even more important than changing them, although uh, I'm not a, a password expert, but changing them doesn't seem like a bad idea either, but I'd start with having different passwords. Um, also, I'd like to share a couple of things. Um, 
my my sister, um, she actually had a timeshare down in Mexico. And when she went to sell it, they said, oh, well, you have to put up so, so much money for something or another. And she did. And then she never got that money back. Um, mm -hmm. I also had a bad experience with next door. I, I always avoid trying to anything that's an ongoing, like they bill your sell, they bill you monthly. I always try to avoid those things, but I wanted to do an advertisement on next door, which I, I did. And then I canceled it, but they kept charging my visa card. And so I changed the visa number they still managed to bill it. And finally I canceled my visa and just went with a debit card for a while. And then I switched over to, I was able to get a, 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 a different kind of bank card other than visa. So anyway. That sounds extremely aggravating. <laughs> I cannot imagine how frustrating that was to have to deal with. Um, I think one thing that you may have already done, uh, but that can be helpful, is to contact the credit card company and say, I don't authorize this merchant to take money from my credit card anymore. And often the credit card company can be helpful and can prevent that. No, but I, it, I did that. Yeah, I, did. I figured you over, might have. This was over about a four or five month period where I kept contacting Visa saying, you know, and, and they kept fixing it. And then um, they, would, they would allow the charge again the next month. And then they would fix that one. So we changed the number uh, and they still charged me the next month. And so I'm like, what should I do? And so finally I just canceled the credit card. I used my debit card for a few months and then I went with MasterCard. Wow. Yeah, that is quite a saga. It sounds so frustrating. That's also something that you could file a complaint with the CFPB about. If there are other folks who are experiencing that same problem where they've told, you know, Visa or whatever company they might be working with uh, to take a certain action to block that merchant and it's not happening for them. It's really helpful for us to know about because that might be something that our agency can follow up on. But I'm sorry that that happened to you. Uh, just thinking back to what you mentioned about the timeshare as well, we do see a lot of scams like that, particularly for the sales of products, like even things like a, a puppy or a boat or a car, where different companies will say, hey, give us the money ahead of time and we'll send you the product and then they don't send it. Or um, they'll pretend to be purchasing something that you have posted for sale and they'll send you um, the wrong amount of payment and then ask you to send it back. And then uh, what ultimately happens is their payment didn't go through and yours did and they take the money and run. So there are a lot of different scams related to the sale of products. I'm not sure exactly what happened with that timeshare. It sort of sounds like the company was um, trying to just scam her and take her money and leave. but. There are quite a lot of different variations of those types of scams as well. Is there a website for looking up specific companies such as Schwab to see the complaints? So our CFPB website has complaints. Like I said, not all are public because it depends on the consumer's preference, whether they ultimately are made public. But you can look at the complaints that have been filed against different companies on our website. Um, I'm trying to think there for different individual people, like a broker, an investment advisor, you can look on FINRA's broker check and the SEC also has a broker check website. But in terms of companies, I think our website would be a good place to go. I'll think a little bit more about that. Maybe there are a couple more. How about the Better, better Business Bureau? Yeah, the Better Business Bureau is great, and they have local offices as well um, that can be very helpful. There's lots of people that in the local offices may be aware of problems that are happening locally that they've gotten a lot of complaints about and might be able to help you with. So, like, if you're looking for a contractor, you contact the, con you know, the Secretary of State and contract with the board, etc. So, 
the art world. I wanted to um, give a few tips. Does anyone have any other questions? Just regarding passwords. Uh, the county sent us out um, a little blurb, I think last month was cyber security awareness month or something like that. So county is always fixated on us employees, making sure our passwords are, you know, secure, yada, yada, yada. Anyhow, this little blurb was talking about passwords and it gave a graph on like, if you have a password, say that's eight characters long, it, you don't have someone sitting in a basement trying to figure out Helen your password. It is a computer database that is just punching in numbers and you know different algorithms. And for like a six to eight um, digit password, it can take like seconds to maybe an hour to crack your password. If your password is say fourteen to eighteen characters long. And it could take like, what was it like, do you remember Russell, like 89 years or something like that for algorithms to go through and detect your password. So one of the tips that the county sent to us was create like a, um, a phrase that you're familiar with. This is not one, but I love Tahoe. And how can you make, make it easy to remember where do you capitalize and maybe you use a number instead of a, like a, the number three for your E or something like that where you mix it up that you can remember what that phrase is. Kate, like Kate mentioned, and yes, it is a good idea to change your password, but I think if you can create a phrase that's a long phrase that you can remember, um, that's another way to avoid scammers figuring out what your password is. Okay, you can add to that or tell me if I'm completely wrong. <laughs> no, that's right. And I think to just to kind of reiterate, it's a lot easier for those algorithms to crack your password if what you use for your password is something that's easily found about you online, like your birth date or your pet's name or things like that, that might be available somewhere online. So it's good to not include those types of personal information in your password. I thought of something to respond to the gentleman that asked about PayPal. I was scammed last summer with a PayPal uh, payment that I made to somebody to buy a ticket up front. And they ended up never sending me the ticket. But because I bought it through PayPal has two levels. Uh -huh. I bought it through the higher level that you pay an extra, I think, like 2% but I got all my money back from PayPal. I doubt they ever got it from the scammer, That's good. but PayPal did pay me back. Yeah, I had to fill out a report and mm -hmm. give them a little backup info. And they give the scammer like 30 days to respond, but the guy never responded. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that helps. All right, are there any other questions? I don't see anyone online or any chat online, but does anyone have any questions in person? If not, we'll let Kate go. Good. All right. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for your time and thanks for your engagement and questions. I always learn a lot from folks like you who ask questions that then cause me to think more about some of the, the topics that we're talking about. So thank you for your time. And I hope that you download or order a couple of our materials and share them around because now that you know, you can share that information with others. So thank you.